Welcome to the Logistics of Logistics, a podcast dedicated to exploring how things get places and the people who get them there. We'll talk with logistics and supply chain leaders about innovation, industry trends, and the future of the logistics business. Now, here's your host, Joe Lynch. Hello, friends. Welcome to the Logistics of Logistics podcast. My name is Joe Lynch. Thank you so much for joining us today. Today's topic is the cargo story with my friend, Sam Lurier. How's it going, Sam? It's going great. Thanks for having me, Joe. I'm excited to finally talk to you, Sam, and I were uh, supposed to talk like a year ago, and that got canceled. And then the next time I think he scheduled like on Memorial Day, I was like, we didn't do it that day either. And then finally, uh, Sophie connected us, uh, who works with Sam. So thank you, Sophie. And um, I'm excited to talk about this topic. I talk to a lot of different people on my podcast and sometimes it's brand new stuff. Sometimes it's, well, yeah, I've heard of something like that. What you have seems like brand new to me. So I'm excited to talk to you. Anyway, Sam, please introduce yourself and your company, where you're calling from today. Yeah. So I'm calling from our uh, Cargo's offices in, in San Francisco, California. I moved out to the Bay Area about six or seven years ago, originally from Chicago. So got kind of started in logistics seemingly pretty young. I think there might be something in the water uh, in Chicago where everyone's thinking about <laughs> space. But I came out to, to study at Stanford University. I was studying electrical engineering there and got an opportunity to go work in a large aerospace company. And that's really where the grounding in supply chain and logistics started. In 2019, I founded Cargo. So at Cargo, we build the hardware and software for the loading dock. We build sensors that go at the loading dock that are filled with optics and a variety of other modalities that perform automated inspections as product comes in and out of the dock door. So you can think of it as automated dock door, uh, data, data capture at the dock door. And that data can be used for a multitude of things, helping prevent claims, OSD, ensure inventory accuracy, and when you aggregate that information, you understand how the flow of products move from point to point along the supply chain. Very interesting. So you actually have some sort of at, at a dock door, some sort of system. Is that, What's it look like? Is it is it just a small sensor? Is it surround the dock door? What's it look like? Yeah, great question. I don't think it's something the industry has ever seen before. It's a 10-foot tall obelisk. We call it the tower, the cargo tower. And so you put two at the dock door on either side of the entry point. And this 10 foot tall tower, as I mentioned, is filled with a variety of different sensors, primarily cameras. So it has 12 different cameras stacked vertically. And the idea is that as product comes in and out, so forklifts move pallets in and out of the trailer, we're capturing all of the information on that pallet. Everything from labels to barcodes, detecting damage, understanding dimensions of the freight, effectively creating a fingerprint of the pallet as it's entering or exiting the trailer. Wow. So so you have vision systems, I'm assuming, they can look at that box and say that box is, I'm going to make this up, 36 inches by 36 inches by, and, and, and make those calculations and say that's that box. And after a while, it starts to recognize certain boxes of a certain size from certain locations. So does the AI get smarter and smarter? Yeah, and uh, you know, we the more data we have, the better. But I think what's really unique about our system is that it actually doesn't require much input at all. You know, I think the difference most AI systems require thousands of examples. That's why it's so difficult to get them deployed in a commercial environment. I think one of the core competencies of Cargo is translating the unstructured information about loading events, so videos and images taken of forklifts moving pallets in and out of trailers and translating that into a set of structured data sets. So you might have an expiration date printed on a case. You might have a UPC barcode printed on a label. And you're capturing all that? We're capturing all of that. And no matter where it is or how it's presented to us, we're taking all of that unstructured data, wherever it might appear on the pallet, and putting that into a set of structured formats that a customer system like a WMS or an ERP system can ingest, process, and make ultimately correct in real-time decisions. Yeah, that's fantastic. I love I love what you're doing because let's just say I, I, I'm running a large warehouse and I'm shipping out 30 shipments every night and 30 shipments every day. And then I find out, hey, you know, the day shift with Sam and Joe is 
not loading the truck the same as the guys at night who are so they're doing something different or better. All of a sudden, I can I can have those insights where I, I never would say, well, they were thirty trucks. Well, maybe maybe we could get away with twenty eight trucks if we started figuring out what makes sense. But until now, we have data going right up to <laughs> the loading event. I know how many boxes got loaded this week and moved out, but I don't, and I know kind of how many went in each truck, but. We have a whole bunch of still. I was talking to Oren Zeslansky, uh, founder of Flock Freight, and he said when I interviewed him the other day that he thinks about, on average, 25% of the truck is empty on any given truck. So when you see these trucks going down the road, 25% is empty. Now, that means one has got one pallet that's ridiculous and others are you know 80% full. But it is a huge problem. And, and as the rest of the world looks to the supply chain, specifically trucking, and says, you need to do better on sustainability, a good start is let's fill the trucks. Yeah. yeah I, I don't think a lot of people outside the industry realize that supply chain problems or climate problems, supply chain problems, or inflation problems. Supply chains underpin a lot of other issues. So if we focus on solving these issues, utilization rates, reducing mistakes, you know, I just saw a statistic that for every misshipped pallet or every misshipped case creates another 30 pounds of CO2 because then you have to reroute those oh, yeah. pallets or cases back to their correct destinations. I mean, that is... That's waste that can manifest itself financially, but also in the environment. And I think what's exciting about the cargo system is not just that those insights that you mentioned, looking back and actually having verifiable data to make decisions, but proactively stopping mistakes, right? Our system works so quickly at the dock door that we'll ensure that you won't load the wrong case or the wrong pallet onto the trailer that you will be using full utilization. Oh, that's a great point. And so the the faster we can have data capture and data transfer to different systems, the quicker we can make decisions in real time. That's fantastic. I love it because, I, I mean, as soon as you mentioned what you guys did before we hit record, I thought, boy, this just gets to be kind of a limitless amount of opportunities. We're going to load better. We're going to load more efficiently you know, more stuff in there, but also we're going to do it more accurately because uh, your system is recognizing that's the wrong tag on there. They get that off the truck. And I, I mentioned to you uh, a situation that I had been a part of where the truck is getting loaded somewhere in Mexico. And then when it was getting unloaded in the US, it was all, everything had fallen down, everything. And so they hadn't been secured properly and it was a mess. And there's all sorts of broken stuff as a result. And not an unusual problem, but when we're using the cargo system, now we start having insights, like how did this happen? And and, and hopefully it doesn't happen over and over again. And um, this is fantastic. But let's come back to that. I want to understand a little bit about you. So you mentioned you grew up in Chicago and then you ended up out in California going to Stanford. So tell us a little bit about where, where you grew up in Chicago, when you went out to Stanford and give us some career highlights before you started the mighty cargo. Yeah, so growing up in Chicago was wonderful. It's a it's a great city for those who haven't been you know, braving the the cold during the winter. It's just getting there. It's getting there. I'm 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 four hours away from Chicago. We get there weather a, a day later. <laughs> it was no, it was a wonderful place, and I get to I got to grow up actually in the city. I went to uh, Lincoln Park High School, and I think that was a immense experience because of just the diversity of folks that. Oh, you lived right in the city. I lived right in the city. And just everybody from different walks of life, different cultures, everybody attended that school. And that diversity of perspective, I think, was very formative for me. And actually, I started the entrepreneurship path very early. I knew very early on, back in the high school days, that I wanted to do something impactful and practical right from the off. And even in high school, uh, one of the only challenges that I could solve was that those of those that my friends were having. And so at the time, I asked all my friends what were their biggest day-to-day problems. And everyone always talked about their their dating lives, right? And somebody like this girl, somebody had a crush on this guy who was going to take this person to prom. And so at the time, we created a dating app. 
it was uh, a way to anonymously figure out whether your crush liked you in high school. Oh, um, I love it. I love it. Rather than having your buddy go over and say, hey, exactly. uh, do, you like, like, do you like Sam? That way to, to have your friend <laughs> figure out, you know, who's into who. I'm back in those high school hallways. And I think that experience was was great. We we had a lot of active users, especially in the Chicagoland area. I think tactically there was probably... Was it a phone app? It was a phone app, yeah. It was a iOS and Android. What was the what was the name of it? It was called Kiss, K I S S. Very nice. I think it was a it was a very interesting journey. We raised actually some capital back then from some local investors, uh, some VCs in Chicago, and I think the the most two most important things that I learned from that experience is, first of all, I think. It's, it's important for the leader of any organization, uh, especially a technical organization, to have an understanding of the core technology. And I didn't have that at the time. I uh, didn't understand even how to build a, an iOS app. Uh, what are the kind of technical components that create the underlying technology? Well, if you go to Stanford, you might meet a guy or two who can help you out with that. Exactly. Well, wait, did the KISS app work for you and your friends, though? I, everyone knew that I was the, the founder. So I think actually in our high school I had the, the, the least penetration. I was uh, actually all the other high schools in the kind of surrounding areas that had, the, I think, the most success. <laughs> that is very cool. So it's funny when you mentioned Lincoln Park, I had a buddy who used to live in Lincoln Park. And man, we loved it when he lived there. That's when my hair started going gray. We partied our brains out over there. But um, what a great area. I love the zoo. I remember taking my kids to that zoo not so long ago. So you chose to go to Sanford. You must have been a fantastic student to get in. You know, I had a really fantastic program. I went to the IB program at, at Lincoln Park, and my teachers were just next next level in, in quality, and they were heroes, really. So I owed a lot to them. I definitely studied hard in high school and had the opportunity to go to Stanford and, and was trying to solve some of those lessons learned in building the app originally. So I studied electrical engineering when I got to Stanford and started trying to understand kind of the broader set of problems that were available to solve. Uh, and we can talk a little bit more about that, but I think there, it's, it's kind of limiting if you just look in the confines of Silicon Valley or Stanford's campus, which we affectionately call the bubble because it's uh, very hard to, to get out. But yeah, the Stanford experience was great as well. Moving to California, I think I've become less familiar with the cold weather. I definitely I find it tough to go back now to the Midwest during the uh, winter. My kids, both my kids live on the West Coast, and uh, they're coming home for Christmas, and I, they'll be in for that rude shock. <laughs> so uh, out of Stanford, where, where was your first job out of school? Cargo. I dropped out of Stanford. Well, now you mentioned you mentioned you were doing some work over with uh, what was that a uh, aerospace company? That's right. So I did an internship there over the summer while I was still at Stanford. I was down in Los Angeles. I was recruited to work in the autonomous flight program. So we were building software and artificial intelligence tools to allow drones to fly uh, and understand their surroundings autonomously. And when, upon arriving to that program, I had about a week of working on this technology before our team actually got reassigned to building supply chain tools, which was curious to say the least, but I think it highlighted that a company can be extremely advanced in the technology we're building. We're truly cutting edge in building autonomous uh, flight systems. And yet, Everybody was focused on the supply chain. It was the hardest thing to get millions of dollars of equipment into our assembly facility in Los Angeles, and parts were going missing all the time, not because there was any nefarious activity, but because right. the systems that were used to track it did not keep up with the advancement of the technology itself. And I think that was one of the first high-level ideas. Companies can be phenomenal at building brands building products, building experiences for their customers. And the supply chain has always traditionally been a cost center that everyone's trying to forget, trying to not worry about. Instead of thinking of logistics and supply chain as a growth opportunity, as, a, as an opportunity to differentiate their products. And now I think things are changing. Right. I love that. I mean, it's an opportunity to differentiate your product through your supply chain and your delivery. I love that. 
And I, I got to tell you this, my own experience, I was, I worked in engineering much of my early career. And then I was launching vehicles in Thailand with the first American, the Jeep was, uh, I think it was a Jeep Cherokee. It was the first American car built in Thailand. So we had to build cars there. And I remember being an engineer, I was like, well, the hard part is figuring out who's the suppliers over there. That was not super easy, but we had a partner that helped us. The hard part is getting so many parts moved from the U.S. to Thailand. And it just is, uh, and it was eye-opening to me. The supply chain to me, we, we didn't even call, we didn't call it supply chain then. It was just suppliers that worked with us. But you start to realize how no matter how good your parts are, no matter how good that car is, if you can't get all the parts to the same place at the same time, <laughs> you're not going to have a car. So anyway, so you started Cargo. Now, that was uh, your experience at the aerospace company. Is that something that informed your decision? It, it definitely did. I think after that experience at the aerospace company, coming back to Stanford's campus, coming back to Silicon Valley, everybody naturally talks about the next big thing. It's talked about in lunch halls and classes, and nobody was talking about supply chain, right? And and I think that was... What year was that? This was 2018, 2019. This was pre-pandemic. The supply chain was a foreign concept. People didn't care. People didn't appreciate how food got to our grocery stores, how packages arrived at our front door. There were a few companies like Flexport and Project 44 and Samsara that have pioneered technology innovation in the space, but relative to how big the supply chain market is, the technology innovation was, was minuscule. And I think that was fascinating and, and exhilarating for me. I love this idea of discovering a market that nobody is thinking about, that is forgotten, paving the way. I think that's a personal preference. I, I admire founders and companies that can out execute 20 different competitors in a, in a very crowded market. For me personally, I'd much rather find a market and, and find an opportunity that seems simple and, and uh, clear in retrospect, but at the time it was passed over. Underserved for sure. And you know, it's, it, it's interesting you mentioned that it's coming from Automotive, which I always say automotive's the biggest, baddest supply chain on earth. We get it. Huge supply chain. But one of the things I would say is to be using technology within your four walls or even in your factory is fairly easy. To to send something to your suppliers, say, hey, make sure you send me these parts, that's fairly easy. But your supplier has suppliers, so and that's the supplier supplier has suppliers. So you have these tier one, tier two, th tier three, four suppliers. And before long, you're way on the other side of the ocean. And to connect all of the, all of the players in that, it's like you've got time zones, you've got cultures, you've got people, you've got different laws for every country. That is way harder than being wired within your four walls or in your, four fa in, in your factory or even to your supply base. But, but here's the, the interesting part, Joe. Every supplier there, your tier ones, your tier twos, your tier threes, every single facility, no matter whether they're producing nuts and bolts or, you know, full doors for the car assembly, each one has a loading dock. And I think right. That, right. that was the core insight with cargo was that doesn't matter how far in the supply chain or what supply chain we're even talking about, food and beverage, automotive, the one commonality. The one building block is a loading dock. That entry and exit point, exit point is universal. And so it provides a phenomenal foundation for linking up all of these disparate players I and love creating that. a common network. To your point, Sam, everything we get, everything we got, and everything, um, the table I'm sitting at, the chair I'm sitting at, the computer, everything came on a truck, but it also went through a loading dock to get on that truck. Right. And hopefully, before long, it will have the cargo. What do you call it? The cargo what? So the cargo tower at the loading dock to be able to ensure the quality, the, the right skew, and the right status of your products as they're moving towards their final. So let's let's walk through like a case study. And you don't have to mention names. So let's just talk about like a, what kind of company. So talk about a company that came to you guys or you came to them, however you met, and what was the problem that they would describe to you that cargo solves for them? 
Yeah, so a company would come to us, and we hear this over and over again, and they describe one flavor of a large umbrella of OSND. For those who are not familiar, OSND is overages, shortages, and damage. So a catch-all term for effectively not either receiving or not shipping the correct quality or the correct quantity or the correct skew of item to the next node in the supply chain. Yep. So say that one more time. OSND stands for? Overages, shortages, and damage. Yep. And by the way, if you ever go to a terminal, you'll see a big sign that says OSND. And usually it's just this disorganized pile of stuff. <laughs> Sometimes it's something that broke open. It's ne- it, it, it's never, and, and this isn't on the tr- trucking companies. This is just so- something somehow <laughs> was an overage or a shortage, which shortage would not be in that pile or it's damaged. And so much of that, I think just is thrown out. I mean, it's just, it's just talk about waste in our supply chain. Somebody took this product, whatever it might, could have been 18 weeks coming all the way from China. And then at some point the box breaks and it's just sitting there, going to be thrown out. I think the tremendous the waste about OS and D is that it's, it's really tough to pin down on a balance sheet or p l because it affects so many different line items. It can affect claims. Uh, it can affect labor, additional labor that you need at the dock door to verify product. It affects inventory accuracy and how much labor you're putting into cycle counts. It affects customer relationships. At its worst, it can affect revenue because customers expect the highest level of inventory accuracy. And so you're eating the cost uh, through claims or potentially risk losing a customer. It involves customer service teams who have to track down missed shipments or wrong orders. So you have to invest in customer service teams that are significantly larger than your customer base. And so all of these different light items, pretty much touching every single core operation of your business, are affected by OS&D. And so you can't capture it neatly in one line item. OS&D is kind of like a almost like a virus that starts to infect different pieces. And create- I, lo- I love that. That's what it is. <laughs> it's what it is. It's a virus. And by the way, you mentioned the OS and D. I always remember when I was managing inbound logistics to a, a, a factory, automotive factory, and we would send LTL shipments. And I remember um, every once in a while, we the, the order would be for 500 and the, the supplier would ship 480. And then the, later on, they would ship... 20 more and we and every once in a while i was like why are they shipping twice in two days and then and then i would look into it and by the way this was happening all the time we had 300 suppliers that were inbound to that location and and we find out well they didn't finish they knew they needed to ship today so they shipped the 480 and then they said we'll just ship another pallet tomorrow well my customer the factory that the automotive factory they were paying for two LTL shipments when they should have paid for one right your system could say hey maybe do you do them on the receiving end also I do them on the receiving and on the shipping input and output making sure both are correct and accurate so what we started doing was saying well let's capture these because that is that second LTL shipment was should be paid for by the supplier not by my customer but there's a ton of those. I mean, and, and by the way, you, 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 that's just the shortages. That's not talking about the damage. That's not sh- talking about the overages, which that's now has to be handled again. Extra labor, extra, extra hassle. It's a cost that you'll never capture. You mentioned that on the, you'll never capture on your spreadsheet. It's just, if it was on the spreadsheet, you'd just say hassle. <laughs> And, and we found uh, in a recent survey that we did conducting with uh, 3PL shippers and carriers is that different nodes in the supply chain handle OSND in very different ways. What we've seen around the 3PL side is since they are providing logistic services to their customers, they invest heavily in manpower to solve this problem. They invest heavily in folks at the dock door, counting, double checking, triple checking. And while that might increase accuracy levels, I mean, you're doing it at the cost of significantly increased labor, which in today's market is just not sustainable. 
They're investing in customer service teams to track down claims and understand whether claims happen. But claims can come in from your customer four to six months after the shipment was made. It is near impossible to understand what happened on a Tuesday morning. Bob, who was loading or unloading the trailer, is long gone from the operation. Yeah, and and by the way, if using Bob as the example, I I hire Bob just to check and make sure we're loading right. So I have extra labor. I don't really ever get any insights from Bob that I can use to make better decisions in the I, I imagine I do occasionally where he might say, "Hey, you know what I noticed?" But that is not a formalized system like having something like the cargo tower that says Here's the insights that we're. St- I imagine if you have a system that's capturing all that with uh, some sort of vision tool, you guys have a ton of data at some point, right? Exactly, and it's data that's verifiable. On you know, you click into any statistic and you keep double clicking, and at some level, what you get is a video and a set of images about what went on and off the trailer, or what happened in between. We've seen some crazy stories of things being broken while loading or unloading. The point being is that you get to the bottom of it and you get to the bottom of it quickly. Instead of spending hours and hours looking through CCTV footage at some grainy video and spending hours trying to decipher what happened, within a couple clicks and a couple minutes, you understand exactly what happened and you can adjudicate the next steps in the event. So circling back to your original question, I think the we have had two examples kind of the two sides of the same coin, one 3PL who had a facility in a a market with particularly high turnover. So maintaining accuracy rates for their customers was hard enough, especially as that they had to retrain people every couple of months uh, and claims were just through the roof. Claims where it was impossible to adjudicate, they were piling up, the team was not big enough to go through it and installing cargo at the dock door, having that verifiable proof and being able to give the claims team, the customer service team, a fundamentally new tool in their arsenal to go understand what happened, make process improvements and communicate that information to their customer. Claims have gone down 90%. And that is going directly into their bottom line. There's paying out claims is simply is just simply thrown away revenue. Yeah. Oh yeah. And you you mentioned earlier the customer relationships that they go um, they go bad because of claims. So when I call you and say, "Hey, you didn't um I received this but it was broken." And you're like, "God darn, I shipped that like 2 months ago." Now you're telling me. And now you're wondering, "Did Joe break it after it got there?" And now he's trying to get oh, there's all that back and forth that is unproductive and it's you can make me happy one way, just resend it, but that's lost revenue, right? Or or you can argue with me and then I say, I don't like working with Sam anymore and that's lost revenue. So it's, there's, it's, it's not an easy, th- is a, it's kind of a no win at this point. So you potentially give me, and if I'm high volume, God, I got to think you guys can pay for your tool pretty darn quick. <laughs> Yeah, you know, the our model is hardware as a service. So it pays off day one. You know, the there's no CapEx costs, which I think is extremely important in, in today's market where large capital projects have been put on hold. Companies are looking for ways to make immediate impact and see immediate ROI and, and allowing us to do the complicated work of you know, reducing the hardware cost, doing the installation, doing the integrations and offering it as a service companies see immediate benefits from reduced labor hours on the service teams, reduced claims costs, increased inventory accuracy. You know, I see this with shippers day in, day out. You know, 3PLs, they invest typically in teams to solve this problem. Shippers, claims departments, largely are just rubber stamping factories. There is no tool for claims or finance teams to do this. So it's like you were saying. I've, I've, so- I know some carriers make it deliberately difficult to file claims. I got to tell you, when when I was still at a 3PL, when we, one, I won't mention the carrier name, but a big carrier, the only way we could get our claims was we had to fax everything. And I was like, fax? Well, we used to have fa- a dedicated fax machine just for our claims. And it was stupid. But I think there, 
it's an basically it's it's us pinging their insurance. So they're not going to try and make it easy for us. You wouldn't believe, or maybe you wouldn't, how many claims just disappear into the ether when you can respond with a video of all the product being loaded onto the trailer. How many claims suddenly don't have a basis? Suddenly the counterparty is just not so sure about whether whose fault it was. Having verifiable information solves the battle, right? It isn't no longer a battle. You get to the truth of what happened four months ago, two weeks ago, yesterday, in a couple of seconds, and you're able to solve it kind of real time. And you know, not to mention preventing mistakes, right? It's not just about adjudicating claims after the fact, but obviously mistakes do happen. Logistics you know, has inherent variance. And so the tool is not just about being able to understand what happened in the past, but able to influence the, the current state uh, and ensure that mistakes don't happen, both on the receiving side, which impacts, you know, garbage in, garbage out. So the, the receiving correctness impacts inventory correctness. And then on the outbound, ensuring that your customers, whoever that next party is, is receiving product efficiently and on time. Yep. Let's get back to a case study. And I love what, again, I love what you guys are doing, Sam. So let's just say back to my automotive roots here. So we're managing inbound shipments for our, our uh, for an automotive assembly facility. And as I'm supposed to get let's just say 5,000 units from this company, I go to pick it up and that's going to be on 10 pallets. So now it would pro- if, if they had it at their location, let's just say they're smart enough to go ahead and have that tower and they load, instead of loading 10, they load nine. And then would they get notified by the, your system in real time? Like, hey, stop, don't, don't shut that door yet. Don't shut that door. We can program any voice to, there's a speaker on the tower too. Uh, Tell them to stop, red lights go off. The the trailer will not be allowed to leave unless there's, unless everything is loaded. And I'll give you one better on the automotive side. We see this with just in time and just in sequence loads where it's not just even about the right quantity. It has to be in the right sequence. And as you know, from your automotive days, right? If if you mess up a load to an assembly plant and the line shuts down, there is a investigation and someone has to... Oh, some, they, they always say it's a million dollars an hour and stuff like that. They close a plant. So so it might tell my supplier, right then, don't shut that door. Oh, by the way, what voice does it use? Does it use like a, Brit, a British lady? Don't don't shut that door. I think that's the, the default. Because I would like like a Mike Tyson voice maybe. <laughs> But anyway, we were, we'll talk about that offline. <laughs> but so when we're loading loading that, they could be warned. But then, so potentially they go, oh, okay, my bad. Now, does that connect to like the transportation management system and say this is coming short if they if they actually did shut the door? Yeah, I mean, we'll, we'll communicate to typically a WMS or an ERP to identify what is actually missing off of that trailer, and then you know. We'll only share that information within the confines of that operation. So whether they want to then use that data and say, actually, guys, it's coming short, so we'll send an, another trailer at a certain point, you know, that, that communication is left up to the operations team in that facility. You can, you, can, you can push data to anywhere that you have permission to push it, I'm sure. So, so then on the other side, let's just say my customer receives this and it's coming in short. It should be 10 pallets and it's only nine. It, it recognizes that. Now, granted, humans can do that too, but this this is now data that is in a system that we can start to draw insights from that are going to be much more useful than just a casual observation by the doc. Exactly. Well, humans can do a lot of things. doesn't mean they need to necessarily do a lot of things, especially if machines can do it better so that the folks that, as you were saying, like in this current labor market, have your people folks you work so hard to train and and hire, have them do tasks within the company that really move the company forward, like improving the customer experience, improving operations. Standing at the dock door and counting, that's something that machines can do really well now and allows folks to do something that's that's more impactful to the operation. Well, I think also when you're, if you ever go to any of those docks, their priority is there's a truck just pulled up. Let's load it, right? And there's we have a, a weight. So they even the, the 
even though they might get insights on something, it's not like there's a system for managing that. It's just kind of a casual observation. And with the high turnover we see everywhere, you know, that's not the guy's job. That's just, so I love that you have a system. So, so let's just say somebody calls you up, how long does it take to get the system installed in my location? So someone calls us up today, we will do an on-site survey. We actually do some customization in the optics to get the peak performance. You can schedule that within the first week. And then we can have towers in the ground a couple of weeks after that. The really exciting thing about the hardware is that it's truly touches as, as few systems as, as possible. So all it needs is one and a half square feet per tower on the ground and 110 volt standard power. No Wi-Fi connectivity required, no network or server access on your facilities. IT teams love us because all they have to do for their sign-off is just to give us that check mark because it really doesn't require any IT infrastructure from the teams. So when the towers go in and we can set up an entire facility in a single morning, it's all about plugging it in, automatically turns on, and you're just going to start seeing data in your systems the next morning. So the, the setup is real quick. How do they pay for it? Do they, is there an upfront cost and then a monthly? No upfront cost. Uh, as I mentioned, it's hardware as a service. So you tell us how many dock doors you want us to monitor and for how long, you know, a year, two years, three years. And then based off that, charge a monthly price. And for customers, as I said, especially in, in today's market, I think that's a lot more preferable because you see the return on this investment on a monthly basis you have 10x, 20x, 30x right off the bat. There's no amortization. So how fast, is, how, how, how fast does it pay for itself? I mean, it pays for itself on day one. We've seen claims that we solve after the first week, and that's paid for that first month. And so now you're just uh, operating better, more efficiently, better inventory accuracy, and you're starting to solve that OSD problem, it's starting to cure the virus across your entire PNL. And so the, the system starts to pay for itself absolutely day one. And then from there, you just see the, the financial benefits. And then finally, what we call return on experience. There's just this peace of mind that everyone in operations gets, that you have something watching over everything that's coming in and out. And you know, we don't factor that into our ROI studies with our customers. I think the ROI studies have to have clear, specific numbers and claims or efficiency. But that return on experience should also be noted because it just creates that level of comfort and visibility that is so important to operations, but it's hard to assign a number to. Yeah. By the way, if I'm working with you, Sam, and I know you have that system and we've talked, let's say you're a supplier to me. And one day I call and say, Hey, Sam, I don't think I, I, either I lost it or you didn't send it. And you go, Hey, Joe, I have this system. And you describe what's going on. And I say, oh, okay, well, maybe we lost it. All right. And well, now all of a sudden I'm looking and going, okay, that's that's a level. I look at you and your company as more competent. You're 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 more. That's an operational excellence. That's going to be an operational best practice before long. I mean, and if somebody says to me, "I'm doing everything I can to make sure that we have the proper throughput," you're like, "Really? <laughs> everything?" <laughs> it just it kind of reminds me. When somebody came up with warehouse management system, all of a sudden that became the default. If you better have one, right? And then it was like same with a transportation management system, and then visibility systems, and and we we just keep expecting more of our suppliers and our uh, our partners. And this, to me, is what the best will have. Exactly. I think we, as you said, we've seen this most recently with visibility platforms. Where now, if you want to engage with the largest shippers. It's it's just a mandatory you know table stakes, and we're seeing that very quickly with cargo because, as you said, it's an operational excellence perspective. It it allows you to run your operation in a more efficient, lean way, but by providing more information, more data for shipper supply chain teams who now require more data, who are getting even more sophisticated in how they do the planning and that real time fingerprint about every pallet that's coming in and out of every single node of a distribution network or a supply chain network is going to be the requirement. And that's really exciting to see because I think when we have that consistent, standardized, real-time fingerprint of pallets, you can start to introduce a fundamentally new paradigm of flexible supply chains, right? The example I always use, especially in recruiting interviews for folks who don't 
you know, who are not versed in supply chain is, a, is an Uber example. You know, rideshare apps, Uber, Lyft, could not have existed without smartphones, right? If we didn't have smartphones in our pocket telling the app what our geolocation is, you couldn't efficiently match cars and people. Imagine having to call up Uber every time you moved a little bit and say, hey, I'm in a different location, right? Well, we're living in a pre-smartphone era in logistics, right? We still have to do the phone calls. We still have to use the paper. There's no standard data point at any of these nodes. And so that's why the, or at least a big part of why the systems have to be so rigid and inflexible because there is no real-time standardized data that everyone can rely on. When you inject that data into the system, which we intend to do with the cargo hardware, everyone has the same language, the same standardized data set. Then you can start building the equivalent of Uber and Lyft, truly dynamic autonomous systems that can route freight based off a bunch of factors, how close the warehouse is, how empty the warehouse is. You know, it's like you don't care if a Toyota or a Honda picks you up when you call an Uber. Well, it shouldn't matter whether it's one warehouse or another warehouse down the street. You should be able to dynamically distribute freight based off of a much higher level of data inputs than what we currently have. So, you know, I think it'll take for a while for cargo to get there and for us to get there and the industry to get there. But I'm really excited about what it means to have a truly flexible supply chain and what that means for commodity prices going down, for reducing how many miles a product has to travel in order to get to its final consumer and all of the kind of accessibility and price improvements that we can get across the board you know, for, for all commodities alike. Right. So when your system, it has, I can obviously can connect to a warehouse management system and any other system easily. Yeah. Uh, warehouse management systems, ERPs. Order management. Order management, both, you know, large you know, top 10 systems and homegrown systems. I've seen a lot of systems that have been around for 20 years and you keep adding stuff. And so we've experienced across the board. Right. So when I, 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 what I'm thinking about is like if I have an order management system and I make this sale on a regular basis, you know, and I start seeing, okay, yeah, that the, the cargo tower is shipping back. Hey, here's, here's, here's what the, uh, here's what the last load looked like. Man, I just all of a sudden have like, so I say, okay, I think I'm going to need three trucks for this one. I know that as soon as I get the order, now I can tell them, yeah, they, for that order, you're going to need three trucks because there's so often you get, I, I remember when I'm still doing moving freight, we'd have customers every once in a while, especially if they're like so many construction type projects where you don't really know how many trucks you're going to need this time of year with Christmas trees. I mean, you're always trying to figure out how many fit and the guy at the dock might know maybe even the guy in the warehouse, but the person who made the sale or the person who put the order into the system doesn't know. And right. so when you call and say, hey, Joe, I'd like to buy this, this, and this, and I go, yeah, blah, 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 plus transportation costs. I don't know what the transportation costs are how, and because and, I don't know how many trucks it's going to be. Yeah, this is, this is fantastic. I love what you're doing. So who's your sweet spot? Who's the, who are the customers who are picking up on this first and saying, that's exactly what I need? I think it's uh, industries generally that have a high cost of a mistake. Whatever that means, either the freight is extremely expensive or the freight is regulated or there's a lot of regulation just within the industry. So, uh, yeah, this is not a catch all, but f food and beverage, both on the retail. Yeah, uh, that makes sense. Uh, pharmaceuticals and medical devices, automotive. So all just in time. and just Electronics, I imagine. Electronics. And that's not to say, you know, CPG or other industries don't have very similar use cases. You know, we're, we're talking to folks in the paper industry, right? They might not neatly fit into those categories I mentioned, but they're also having OSD problems. I think it's a universal challenge, but I think it's probably most pronounced in industries with that high cost of mistake because you're spending a lot of money either preventing the mistake or paying for the mistake. And you're in this kind of catch-22 where it's one or the other, pick your poison. And now there's a way where it's neither option. You neither have to pay the mistake 
and you're able to prevent it. Yep. So let me ask another question. I, I should have asked this earlier, but when I'm putting, let's say I'm putting a box or, or pallet in, is your vision system checking the dimensions of that and then also looking at the barcode? Yes, we're, we're collecting the way you asked kind of about the deployment. When we go on site, we sit down with an operations team and we get a effectively a menu of options, not options, but of data points that it's important for them to collect about every piece of freight. And it changes based off industry, right? Automotive might ask VIN numbers. Food and beverage needs to know expiration codes and lot date, uh, lot codes and production dates. And so we collect all those data points. Dimensions is one of those data points, right? LTL, freight, uh, air freight, other industries, it's important to know those dimensions. So we collect what are those two, three, four, five data points that constitute the fingerprint of the palette. And that is the inputs to our software system. So we say, all right, so for this customer, every palette needs to extract these three data elements or these five data elements. And if we can't, for whatever reason, there's a ripped label, the barcodes on a different side, you know, whatever happens. We've seen a bunch of different cases in logistics, right? We'll call that out proactively to our customer and say, hey, this is not conforming. Well, let's figure out what's an issue about that. And so that happens, you know, one in a hundred to one in 500 pallets. But having that human in the loop allows our customers to trust the system because logistics is never going to be perfect. It's never going to be fully automated. Or we're able to call out when we don't get the data points that are critical uh, for the customer. So let's just say, what, what, I know some people ship like customized stuff. So they say, hey, this is a one-off. But I'm, I'm assuming it's still useful because you can show that I've got all this stuff on here. And I can start to say, even though it's a one-off, it's not going to be, there's going to be something similar to it going forward, right? Yeah, I think, first of all, having even video footage, right? Even if we're not picking up all the yeah. dis- points for every pallet is crucial, right? It's, it's still having that verifiable proof. And then on top of that, right, we work with our customers to, to our system is able to handle a lot of variants. I think there's, and you know, it's a whole nother technical discussion, but our system can handle different label types with only one or two examples. We call it constellation label reading. So if you, even if you've seen this label once before, we're able to now read it all future times again. And if we see a new type of label, we'll flag it to our customers through our client operations team and say, hey guys, here's a new type of label. Can you help us decipher where are those three data fields that you're important? Like, is this the expiration date or is that the SKU number? And so having that system that can float up these edge cases automatically and be able to now incorporate them in production with only one or two cases, I think really stands out from a technology perspective in this field. I love it. So you guys are constantly trying to flag, hey, this is this is a, a non-conforming. You're, and, and, and so the longer I'm using your system, the more insights I get because your system is always learning. And I'm always learning how to, how to get better and better. We flagged a lot of fantastic. non-conforming items and, and uh, companies have now turned on supplier training and supplier conformance. conformance. It, it's just never existed. You never had the data set to say, hey, right. 5% of yours are afraid is non-conforming. It's not meeting the standards. Before it was impossible to show, quantify, and prove that. And without data, how can you actually start quantifying change or process improvements. Now with automated doc, data capture at the dock door, you're starting to actually influence and make changes and increase performance over time. Nobody wants to receive a box to their very busy factory or warehouse or even to your home without labels, without information about why am I receiving this? Right now it's starting to be Christmas season. I start seeing stuff on my porch, right, from Amazon. I have some sense for what that is, but I'm only receiving one thing. And I think if you're in a big warehouse or big factory, you're like, what is this? I don't want to have to open that up. So I want my system, or ideally their system, my my supplier captured it first and said, hey, stop. This one doesn't have a label or it's got tape over the label or whatever's gone wrong. Catch it there. Don't make Don't make me do extra work and have five extra guys in my large facility 
with a pile that they're going through and cutting them open to see what the hell's in there. So this just this is labor saving, and uh, to your point, it saves money right away. So you, you mentioned the sweet spot is for anybody who has got something that where the cost of mistake is high. I also throw this out there. I would think anybody who is any company that is really focused on operational improvement, because from my perspective, you want to go, you want from order to cash to be digital. You want that digital twin. And there, right now, we know there's gaps. This is one of those gaps. I know what's in the. I know what was in my warehouse. I I kind of know what's in my truck, and I know what was delivered. I want order to cash visibility. This is just one more place where data point. Correct. We did it. It's arguably the most important data point because it's that yes. digital transaction, that handoff of product from into the from the trailer into the facility or in the facility into the trailer so many people have a vested interest it's the 3pl it's the shipper it's the carrier it's the you know potentially the broker right the, there's financial implications of what's happening there there's so many different transactions uh, capacity management routing planning order management that's happening because freight is moving hands at the dock door and now people realizing you know, what cargo is building, they're asking, well, how have we not had data capture that is effective and scalable and consistent so that everybody right. has the same type of data at the, on the dock door? I think one of the biggest value adds kind of systematically across the supply chain is now everybody can communicate in the same way. Cargo is picking up all cargo towers sit on the same network. Now we don't share data between customers or between facilities without approval, but now you have all the suppliers within a particular network feeding in one retail location or one retail company. Now suddenly everyone speaks the same language and that data standardization never existed. Now you might've seen on the news just the last couple of days, you know, JB Hunt and uh, Uber Freight and, and Convoy talked about creating a standard API for doctor scheduling. And I think that's very important and admirable that you know we're starting to create some consistency. Cargo is doing something very similar on creating that fingerprint for a pallet, what's coming in and what's coming out. And if we can standardize that across every node in the supply chain, you're, you're going to save so much time and so much waste trying to speak different languages. You know, my license... Oh, yeah. Your license plate, my SKU master is different from your SKU master. The way I read, you know, dates is in the European fashion. The way you read dates is in the American fashion. So now our products, you know, expired because we've read dates different ways, right? Standardizing that data structure is going to create so much efficiency over time. Right. I love what you're doing. I love what you're doing uh, with uh, this because in any business... I spent most of my career, early career in automotive, and we used to say the hardest part is handoffs. So when I hand off what I've designed to the guys who have to build the tools, they that that's a handoff. And to some extent, it used to be like throw it over the wall, right? I did I did my job perfectly. I throw it over the wall. Those tool makers don't know what they're doing. The tool makers make parts, and then they throw it over the wall in manufacturing. Said so I did I did everything I was supposed to do. But what I think is we all know has happened is this is a really complex problem you guys have taken on. There's always been this sense that, okay, the, the warehouse, they think they did the right job. We loaded that truck. We did everything we were supposed to do. Now the trucking company needs to do their job. Well, we were kind of throwing it over the wall too until now when you start saying, no, no, there's data that's, that verified this was a good handoff. Right. Exactly. Anyway, I know I went way over my time with you, so uh, I'm going to try and wrap this yeah, bad boy these, up. So uh, discussions, it's uh, you know, it always gets me fired up talking about where where things can be going. So speaking of where things are going, so what's what answer in any order you want? What's next for you? What's next for for cargo? And then what's next for this industry in regards to this problem we're discussing? Yeah, well, for me personally. One of my favorite parts of the job is that every three months the job changes. You know, when when I'm a solo founder and it was just me trying to push the company along, is very different to when there's five people on the team, when there's ten people on the team, now forty people on the team. 
And I imagine that the role is going to fundamentally change when there's 60 people, 80 people, 100 people. Um, it's, it's important that I can scale with the role to ensure that the, the company can continue growing as quickly as possible. I think for, for Cargo itself, we, I think, have already emerged from a technology perspective as best in class from a hardware perspective and that vision perspective, mapping the, the real world into the digital world and continuing to push that advantage is critical. And the way we do that is by hiring the best people. I fundamentally believe that you know, great companies, transformational companies are built on great people. We've done an exceptional job hiring people who are not just I think the best at what they do in technology or sales, but also have cargo's core value, which is to operate without ego. And when you put those two things together, you get a great group of folks who are trying to solve some of the largest infrastructure problems. So in order for us to keep scaling the technology advantage, keep broadening or go to market, it's all about finding the right people and, and building on the great team foundations that we have. And then about the industry, I think kind of going back to this point about data flow and data standardization, I think the next paradigm of supply chain uh, has to be more flexible. We saw this in uh, COVID where the rigid systems created for good reason, right? It wasn't created out of any sort of mistake. It was created out of necessity that when you're moving so many goods for so many people, you need fixed and rigid systems has to have flexibility, but in order to have flexibility, you need some sort of standardization. It can't be done manually over and over again. And we're seeing this in pockets. I think uh, doctor scheduling has been so infuriating for so many years because heck, it's just trying to schedule an appointment time. We do that in our daily lives so often. Why is scheduling appointment time so challenging in a different industry? It's great to see some of the largest players start to tackle this problem. I think, as I mentioned, Cargo is going to try to attack this problem through standardizing how we identify and kind of qualify these pallets and, and using that data to understand material movement with consistency that has never happened before. And, and working towards a vision that, you know, when a pallet is produced at a you know, point of origin in the factory, it can be dynamically routed to its point in a much more efficient way because real-time data and real-time consistent standardized data allows us to make decisions faster because we can move the decision-making process from a person with 20 years experience to now an algorithm who can use the mathematically optimal you know, routing methodology to get it. We have all the algorithms. We just don't have data we can trust that reflects the real world and the current state of freight. And getting to this time where we can now start to dynamically and more flexibly move product from point of creation to point of consumption, I think is going to be the biggest theme over the next 10, 20 years. Oh, that's fantastic. I, I get to chase when you, when you first started talking to me about this, first thing I started thinking about is containerized freight. So, we would not have world trade. We would the, the world would be a much poorer place <laughs> if we didn't have the container. That container made loading and unloading ships really easy. So I think the the expense came down so much that we could afford to trade across over the ocean. And we also just started saying, okay, we're going to fill these containers. So, we're, so the what they were doing before was. I'd show up with 10 boxes. Sam shows up with a, a, a bag of stuff. And the damage was enormous. The theft was enormous. The loading was dangerous and people died. I mean, it was a horrible, horrible business. And what you're, what you're kind of going to drive us to, Sam, I'm pretty sure, is you're going to start driving us probably one facility at a time and then an industry towards standardized containers. And, and you could see where somebody as a trucking company says, we want to fill with standardized containers. We take 70 of these, 40 of these, 20 of these, or 10 of these. And you just say, okay, boom. And that's how we're going to start filling these trucks and being efficient because we're all we're all in the same boat. We all want fewer empty miles. We all want fewer 
uh, half empty trucks or thir three quarters empty trucks. But we never really had a handle on how we could get there. Well, you're starting, I mean, you're not there yet, but I can see where you're going is we're going to end up with standardized containers for shipping. Exactly. I mean, so, and, and, and there will always be, there will always be stuff that doesn't fit, right. but it reminds me of a project I worked on many years ago, an automotive project. Program management came out and said to all the engineers, we're going to have three, this is besides powertrain, we're going to have three fasteners, small, medium, large. Here they are. If you need something outside of small, medium, or large, you come to us and you sell us that you, that you can't make the small or medium or large fit. And miraculously, they killed it to like eight fasteners besides the engine. And it was like, how did you do that? Well, everybody was creating their own fasteners for a long time because they needed to until you've kind of forced the issue. Stop creating new fasteners. Because at the, fa the, at the plant floor, you would say, I don't want 80 different fasteners. It's going to cause grief. We have to ship them all. You're making life hard. We're making life hard for ourselves with so many different boxes, pallets. Anyway, enough of my blather. Sam, tell me a little bit about um, what conferences you guys will be at. Where will we see the fine folks from Cargo? Yeah, well, we're excited to participate in Promat. We're going to have our hardware there. Where is Promat? Promat's in Chicago in March of 2023. And exciting. Got to go back to my hometown this time around. And we're, we're going to have lots of examples of our hardware there. You, you can't miss it. These are 10-foot tall towers. And it's going to be a really exciting time. And then we're doing the retail supply chain conference in Las Vegas in May. So that's, I think, very exciting because when people focus on the complexities of a retail supply chain, uh, how many different suppliers they have, how to coordinate all that. It goes back to all the themes we were talking about today, about coordination and standardization. So love to, to show some of our hardware there. Uh, seeing is believing. I firmly believe that, and especially in this industry. You know, there's been a lot of false starts and false dawns. So I think it's, it's very critical to see it, to touch it, to feel it, to understand the power that the technology brings before testing it out in, in a particular use case or a particular uh, environment. Yep. And what I'll do, Sam, is I'll put a link to your LinkedIn profile. I'll put a link to uh, the website. Do you guys have any videos that we can put in the show notes? We, we do. Uh, so we have the well, video that's on the header of our website, but also just released a uh, summary video at one of our customers showing the product and highlighting some of the core benefits. Excellent. We'll put a link to that. If you if Sophie gives that to me, we'll put that in the show notes. And um, so we'll put a link to your LinkedIn profile, the website, the uh, a video showing what this does. And oh, one last question, Sam. Who should I interview on my podcast? A smart young man like yourself or a woman? So there's a gentleman, you know, his name is uh, Trey Clausen, started a company that is revolutionizing how we source parts. You know, we're customers of them. We think about how to source electrical parts and how varied the suppliers are and how complex it is to manage our supply chain and all of the electrical components that go on the boards that go into cargo towers and having a system that can proactively understand and you know, think through that and give us those insights is critical. So uh, Trey's your man. All right. I will, I will see if he'll be willing to come on and talk to me. Thank you so much. I really appreciate you taking the time. I love what you guys are doing. Congratulations on a cool idea. Great company. Thank you, Jeff. Talk soon. Yep. And thank all of you for listening to my podcast. Your support's very much appreciated. Until next time, onward and upward. You've been listening to the Logistics of Logistics podcast, where we engage in conversation with experts in the logistics field. For more details, visit thelogisticsoflogistics.com or follow Joe Lynch on LinkedIn.